at the moment, um, something of great thankfulness and satisfaction tinged with melancholy, and I don't know what I'll feel like in two days' time, but the whole thing has suddenly sort of moved gently to a proper end, this business of being able to ordain before I go, and people have been not only kind to me, but I've had things like um, one of the ordinands saying that he started on it because of something he heard me say ten years ago, and you, I have a feeling that I've, I've been allowed to do a job, uh, I have a sense of handing it over to people, and, and I just feel quietly thankful at the moment. Saturday, July the 2nd, several thousand people gathered on Palace Green at Durham Cathedral to say goodbye to their beloved bishop. You know the chap, he's the one who doesn't believe in the virgin birth and the resurrection. I always get late to the bums after a service, you see, you just stand there shaking hands and you know, have to make a special hot cup of tea with the time I arrive. Still, that's all over. What ended with a cheer began ten years ago with an ecclesiastical storm. Two days after David Jenkins' consecration at York, part of the Minster burned down. Some said, in all seriousness, that it was God's retribution for the appointment of a faithless bishop. There were many temples that David Jenkins wanted to tear down. Temples of greed and economic idolatry, of raw individualism and institutionalized selfishness. Within his own church, he wanted to shake the pillars of cosy reasonableness and let reason thrive. Jenkins, the academic, had become Jenkins, the lightning conductor. Yes, well, I suppose it must be almost exactly ten years ago I'd come up because it was now all confirmed that I was going to be the Bishop of Durham and to meet various people. And Bishop Michael of Jarrow um, uh, said, I'll take you out to the Penchor Monument because it'll be like uh, Moses on Mount Pisgah. You can see all the promised land all around. And so we came here and I remember as we got out at the gate down there, um, I had a funny sort of feeling really, half sick because I didn't know, half anticipatory because the whole thing fitted in so well with what if I was going to carry out any further ministry I was concerned about. There was this amazing mix of countryside and villages, some of which were almost looking abandoned, and industry over the hill, coal mines, which I sometimes knew, somehow knew then were liable to close down, and the whole challenge of how in a situation where people have had the bottom knocked out of their lives so very often and live in what I must say are some of these, some that seemed then, uh, rather depressing areas. How, how do you bring the church alive for such people? Not the church, of course, but God and hope and neighbourliness. And then from here you see, you can see right over on the horizon, the uh, cathedral, which has been there for 900 years and dominates the area. So it seemed to fit if I was going to have another 10 years of active ministry into something I'd been concerned with all my life. But on the other hand, the challenge, the uncertainty was um, ooh, pretty frightening, really. But you already knew the failings of the church, the, the difficulty the church had in addressing these problems that you were trying to address. Yes, but as I've said again and again, uh, uh, one basic part of my faith is that even the church can't keep a good God down and you have to work through human beings, the institutions you've got, great spread. I mean, as you look around here, you can see uh, spires and things, you know, the church is there on the ground. And so it's a question of enlivening. I'm bound to say that I have felt at the time, and I feel more strongly now, that in facing the really realistic questions I was trying to tackle, the church might find itself almost split apart, opened up to all sorts of newness. But uh, it was a good place to start from. I did expect more, uh, more support, 
um, audible and visible support from many people on the sort of higher ranks of the church. I got a lot of support behind the scenes, of course, uh, but I did find myself somehow looking as if I was the only person saying these questions had ever come up, whereas everybody knew very well. They'd been up for 40 years, 60 years. So I, I, I did get a bit cross and disappointed by that, but then we got into your stride, and there was so much support, you see, right from about the second day of the fuss, the letters poured in, and they were mostly in favour, and people saying, thank God, keep it up, and all the rest of it. But the headlines continued to roar. David Jenkins never managed to convince his evangelical and Tory critics that he was really a very orthodox priest. But down along the River Weir, he had no trouble convincing people of his sincerity and his practical Christian conviction. When the government decided for reasons of European strategy that the Pallian shipyard should close, David Jenkins persuaded the church to put pounds rather than the more easily traded platitudes into an attempt to save it. The attempt has so far failed. But in meetings with trade unionists and MPs like Bill Etherington, he's continued to keep a dialogue with a fractured Sunderland community. My sadness is yours, I think, which is that the government seems to simply stick by the rules. It might be that nothing can be done, but here is a yard which has been kept open with a great deal of local support which has um, a, a trained workforce around available. It appears there is actually a practical offer of ships that need refitting. So we're not asking for subsidy. We're not asking for something contrary to market principles. We are simply asking for a bit of help in helping this community. And it does seem very sad uh, that somehow um, it, it's not receiving sympathy because Sunderland, after all, has been hammered and hammered and hammered. Yes. And that was why, as, we, as you all know, I mean, from the church point of view, although we couldn't put in much, we did try and put in a few thousand pounds to help with getting the guarantees together. Yes, there's a, there's a certain irony involved in as much as uh, he will have a position where there's someone who was guaranteeing to bring work to the town and there have been millions of pounds spent uh, through various development agencies trying to bring work to the city which has only been moderately successful and, and in essence what the government is saying is well we'll turn this work away. Yeah I think it's one of these examples of where um, you talk about freeing the market, but actually everybody regulates according to their own rather dogmatic and practical approaches and won't be pragmatic in ones that they somehow don't want. And I can't understand really why um, there, there is this sort of, it looks like government down on this part of the world. And surely, if the government would only give a sign, I mean, I think people up here just feel that the, the government doesn't care. It's no good what it says. This is what I'm really so worried about. There is just total disbelief, total cynicism, and it's amazing to me that the, the county and so on, and the people and so on, have so held together. I think in a different temperature and temperament, there would have, well, I wouldn't have been surprised about riots up here, quite honestly. Yeah, I don't want to be alarmist, because mm -hmm. people just, but they just feel let down. This constant business of hope deferred, hope deferred, hope deferred, new schemes which don't really come off and so on, builds up a very dangerous um, political cynicism, which is also a very dangerous community apathy. Mm -hmm. And you can destroy the human resources here if you don't do, and any, any sign, however small, I think, could be very important. For somebody who's, who's out there with a, with a lad who's unemployed, it, it's very hard, as it's, as you see, we're involved in it, you know, to, to get it across to the lads. Because the only thing that they can do is every four years they can vote. And what do they vote? They vote Labour, right? And they think because we vote Labour in this area, at times we get punished for that. Not that we're going to change not voting Labour, but we get punished for it, you know? Yes, but then you've got to wait for these changes in the country, which do seem to be around at the moment. I mean, we're going through a series of elections at the moment, all of which seem to be underlining the fact that most people are fed up with the government, but the real crux is that nobody knows where to turn to do anything better. Faced with an avalanche of industrial decline, David Jenkins knew that one direction in which he couldn't ask his people to turn was to a god of whim and fancy miracles. Despite the headline allegations, he insists he does believe in the mystery of God. He just doesn't need him to walk on the waters of the River Weir to prove it. Holy Trinity Church, Darlington. Trinity Sunday.
Bishop Jenkins has perhaps found it easier to address an agnostic congregation than those within the church, concerned, as many of them are, with a nervous and embattled Anglicanism. But there are moments when the practicalities of church life and the essence of the bishop's message coincide. I've said for many years now that it isn't actually the Holy Spirit which keeps the Church of England going, but the church commissioners. And now, by the grace of God, they're losing their money. So we shall have to trust in the Holy Spirit. Just think of that. Just think of that. We'll have actually to be Christians in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, let us be enlarged. Therefore, let us serve. Therefore, let us rejoice in this name and power and glory of God. Father, greater than great. Son, more loving than love. Holy Spirit closer than close, and all one God in us, for us, through us, and beyond us. And to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I was in Leeds when you moved up here, and I remember you coming back to the university on one of occasion to talk about, uh, it was a whole seminar day arranged by the politics department I think on religion and politics uh, and um, I remember what a much better showing you gave than Selwyn Gummer that day but you also uh, were still sort of struggling with the public image and mind you I have to say that to do better than Mr. Gummer wasn't very difficult. So you um, sorry about that, but I mean, I don't, I don't wish to get, I don't wish to get too much credit for that particular occasion. And after your Minster Court fire, um, somebody did seriously say to me, "Surely it was a bolt from the Almighty." I know. And I had to say to them, "I said, well, well, I'm sorry about this, but if it was." Both his timing and his aim were completely well, wrong. Well, you, you see, that is exactly what, you know, my press officer, the, yeah. Rebecca, yeah. said immediately, you see. She said, well, um, yes. <laughs> there was, there was actually, looking at the circumstances, um, the first thing was that he was properly aiming at the General Synod, but he missed <laughs> even that. There are those who think that a more appropriate target would have been Bishop David's tied house on the hill, Auckland Castle. He's a heretic to some. As worrying to others, he's a prophet of our times. But which does he think is nearer to the truth? Well, they're probably quite close together, aren't they? In that um, what people label heresy is often uh, a way of explaining things or a way of raising questions beyond things which people find disturbing. So if you're going to go deeper into the faith to try and see, now how does it apply today? or how does it affect our future in, on this earth, let alone hereafter, which may move you in the direction of people saying prophetic, you know, you're raising questions that ought to be raised, you're facing issues, you're helping people to see it applies. You, you may stray into what many people regard as heresy because they've got rather a constricted and restricted view of the way in which, shall we say, sentences in the New Testament or formulations in the creeds actually apply to reality. It's the reality that faces a generation not yet schooled in theological semantics that most concerns David Jenkins. The bright-eyed and hopeful who one day will be relegated to a jobs market that may offer them nothing. Boys, yes. the bishop support this right through his time here and he's retiring, so we've given him a little plaque to remind him of his days he's been at our football matches. Oh, Thank you very much. Yeah, there we are, yes. Attention everybody, I'm just going to miss the ball. There you are, do something about it. 
Hey, look what I've got. You've got this as a prize for you, is it? Yes, for, for ten years. Yes, that's right. Yes, missing the ball nine times out of ten, you see. <laughs> that's a real record. It's my one and only football trophy, you see. But in uncertain times, the pretty certainties of the Sunday School picture, which for generations have engaged simple people with complex religious ideas, are surely even more important. The simple people have to be given a simple belief which will simply stand up to the realities they simply encounter. And uh, false religious assurance, for instance, OK, there was a virgin birth, there is no doubt about it, simply leads itself in simple people's minds once they hear about the stories in India and all the rest, which say lots of other virgin births and so on. They don't get the uniqueness of it. Um, simple business about heaven and hell can simply become fear if you do wrong, <laughs> longing for escape, instead of entering into the deeply realistic wrestling with how can I be saved from wrong, how can I know what's wrong, and the assurance comes from knowing that God is prepared to face these things, be, remain with you in them, forgive you no matter what, and then take you forward. The simplicity lies in faith, in fellowship with fellow Christians, and in being ready simply to face whatever comes along and then seeing where you get. I am quite clear that if God was, for instance, the sort of neurotic character who is out laid it down forever that women shall not be priests, or the sort of neurotic character who will send people for, to hell because they haven't got seven out of ten in the list of beliefs, then I would be an atheist. Of course, I don't believe that because people believe wrongly about God, he can't help them, or he isn't helping them. Because, I mean, I'm sure I get certain things wrong myself, and I'm totally dependent on the grace of God. And now we give you thanks that you have called these your servants, whom we ordain in your name, to share this ministry entrusted to your church. Send down the Holy Spirit upon your servant Caroline for the office and work of a priest in your church. Send down the Holy Spirit upon your servant Joan for the office and work of a priest in your church. Send down your Holy Spirit upon your servant Alison for the office and work of a priest in your church. Send down the Holy Spirit upon your servant Deborah Mary for the office and work of a priest in your church. Send down the Holy Spirit upon your servant Caroline for the office and work of a priest in your church. Almighty Father, give to these your servants grace and power to fulfill their ministry among those committed to their charge, to watch over them and care for them, to absolve and bless them in your name and to proclaim the gospel of your salvation. Set them among your people to offer with them to the sacrifice. Florence, yes, here we are. I nearly said that and make an honest man of you. I meant an honest man. <laughs> Joan, yes. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Yes, you are. Stephanie. Yeah. There we are. Yes. Alice White. Yes, there you are. And Friday. Caroline. Well, there you are. Now go and enjoy yourselves. God bless and uh, yes. oh, <laughs> You've got one Bishop Rooney anyway. <laughs> You've given us a very precious gift this week yes. and today and yesterday. And we'd like to give you these roses. Uh, there are 40 of them, so somebody tells me I can't count that far. <laughs> and, um, and I know we're English, but the Archdeacon has given me permission to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely marvellous. It is very sweet. Well, thank you very much. Very sweet of you. I wouldn't spoil it by saying before you're on, you'll be somebody else's worry, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, cheerio. Yes, it really is, isn't it? Great. Yes, splendid. Thank you so much. Right. Yes, and of course, I shall be with you in spirit, you bet. Yes, yes, that's great. That's very sweet indeed. Thank you.
It was for the mining communities of the northeast of England that David Jenkins went to the barricades. He knew that the industry was going to be emasculated. He begged the government to consider the human effect of its economic course. To the embarrassment of Labour politicians, he was called the official opposition. To the Tories, he was meddling in politics and abusing the Christian message. I think, as a matter of fact, that given the complexities of politics and the limitations of politicians, that most of the Conservative politicians are going for this are really extremely muddle-headed. Whether they're wicked as well, of course, is a thing for them to make, work out. You've made it clear yourself um, how much you abhor Thatcherism, certainly many aspects of Thatcherism. Um, do you think you were wrong to speak so clearly about that? No. I think these questions had to be very clearly and sharply raised, and I think they need raising almost more sharply now when it is increasingly clear that what people call uh, the prosperity we're supposed to be delivering and looking forward to um, leaves more and more people out of it. They keep on talking about trickle-down, but it isn't so. Uh, it leaves more and more people out of it, and the actual growth of this productive machinery does really threaten the world in many ways. So there's a false prospectus on, and everyone ought to face it. What I've always tried to do is to say that I'm not able to comment on people's personal motives, hence my sticking to a policy verging on the wicked, not saying that um, Mrs Thatcher was any more wicked than the rest of us. The miners' welfare in Easington, a community that still sets its clocks by a shift pattern long gone. How is it at the moment? People just feel flattened? Well, I think that the people do feel flattened. It's uh, a year since the quarry, you know, finally closed, and the quarry's under demolition now. And uh, the worry is for the younger members of the workforce who are really fear now on a on a job market. There's no jobs for them, and, uh, and it's a, it is a worry for the community how it's going to go forward and uh, with with no work there, a real worry. At least during the '84 strike, as bad as it was. People could see an end to it. Yeah. People knew it wasn't going to continue the way it was. But the present position, the, the community breakdown, uh, people moving away from the community, empty houses, dereliction in places, there isn't any end in sight under the present moment. No way out at all. There's no jobs, no future. So what is going on? Of course, I've been round some of the streets for forty years. Well, I mean, it's enough to drive anyone to suicide. They, to be quite honest. What? Yes, what? the other day, the um, Samaritans were want the uh, man the other day asking about the suicide rate in the Colliery areas. Yeah. They'd had a uh, vast number of calls, yeah. increase of some 70 to 80 percent on calls contemplating suicide yeah. from young married couples that had split due to the job situation and others of the, the young lads that have got no prospects whatsoever in this community. I mean, what is wealth about? Wealth is not really in the end about a few people making a lot of money. Wealth is about helping communities to um, to live together and have something to care for. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing, they've taken away the dignity of work. Yeah, yeah. A, a man needs the dignity of work, and they've taken that away. As far as I was concerned, it was just like a bereavement on a colossal scale. When you go into a family who's just lost somebody, everybody is devastated. It doesn't matter whether it was a sudden death or whether it was an expected death. They are still devastated. Their minds are in a turmoil. They've just sliced cut off their heart and they don't know which way to turn. And the closure of the mine, the, the, the provider, was the provider for this community. When that mine was closed, the provision for the people in this community was taken away. And as, as I said to somebody the other day, when the provider died, and he says, no, Vicar, the provider didn't die, he was murdered which is probably a bit a more accurate thing to say. But the fact is, the provider is dead. It's said of David Jenkins that his greatest success has been getting God talked about in pubs and clubs. He might argue that an altogether more impressive achievement was to get God onto the agenda of the Enterprise Society. The construction sites of Teesside are portrayed as a symbol of prosperity reborn. 
And here too, the bishop has been made welcome. Businessmen and planners like Ron Norman of the Teesside Development Corporation are prepared to listen to a message that's sometimes blunt and often uncomfortable. It's kind of you to um, introduce a sort of Trojan horse into your midst. <laughs> because, uh, and I'm most grateful to everybody who's come, because I would be delighted if we could um, reflect on, it seems to me, three points that have struck me in my ten years around here. The first is that the business people and commerce and professionals seem to be unusually committed to the area, so that there's a great deal of hope. The second thing is that it seems to me that, as this place evidences, there looks like being a considerable economic upturn. And the third thing is, it seems to make damn all difference to most of the people I deal with. That is to say, on the ground, you know, in a lot of poor people who will have no jobs, whatever happens. And I, it, it's a great mystery to me about where we go from here, really. You, you see what I mean? There are enormous forces, forces involved, usually directed nowadays by the state in all our countries, not just this country. And this is the, the thing which makes us also, in regions like the North East, victims, as it were, rather than having our own destiny in our hands. And the answer is to return to us the historical capital and enterprise that we had. We can't tinker at the edges. We can't provide short-term relief immediately, which is going to produce a long-term solution. A long-term solution is a big, radical redevelopment of the area, and that takes time. It will take ten years to redevelop this area. It will take another ten years to make sure that all the benefits are well uh, appreciated by all the community. It's a difficult process. And doesn't that mean that really something else does need to be set up alongside this which can do things interim-wise for those communities which have no benefit at the moment and think they've been sitting around, you know, and nothing's happened in three years. Well, it's this difference of time scale because, uh, you know, when I go to places where mines have just closed or whatever, I mean, uh, people have had the stuffing knocked right out of them and are really quite depressed in a very deep sense. Marriage is being broken up and all sorts of things. This, this sort of state manipulation of capital into pension funds, for instance, through tax incentives, um, government itself taking over nationalised industries, making political decisions in London, all this contributed over many decades to the drain of the, the quality people. The, typically, the, the, the family that in the 1920s used to run a, a major company in Northumberland, their grandson today is probably managing your pension fund, Bishop, in... Because we haven't got know, a pension fund at the church. Well, that's one of no, the problems. Well, okay, <laughs> well, sorry. <laughs> 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 you know, you know, all our pension funds in London, yeah, yeah. monetarists like myself believe is that the value of money is absolutely critical. The money in your pocket, as Harold Wilson used to say. The money in the pockets of the poor who are saving, the, the young who are saving, the old who have saved. That value is critical, not just to them, but the entire economy. And monetarists wish to establish the meaning and uh, sanctity, if you like, <laughs> of the pound, because that is the currency within which, you know, people in the temporal world uh, have discourse, just as in the currency of the belief in God and the Bible is the currency of the church. And uh, I, as a, someone who supports business and a, a conservative monetarist, a market economist, if you like, have found, have felt resentful that we've been accused of something evil by, in fact, trying to maintain the very basis of, of all societies, left, right or centre, which is the value of the promise of the government in its money. Well, I hope you will join in a campaign to, to tackle the next level up, which is international finance, which seems to me to have turned money into a commodity, which then makes it, um, actually, its value is not related to wealth lower down. I, I can certainly see that the value of money on the one hand is important, but the alienation of money yeah. from those whom it should serve, yes. I agree with you entirely. On the point of trust, by the way, um, the Gospel says you should love people and not necessarily trust them, I think. I mean, I, I, I mean I, I, it, that certainly applies within the church. You know, I mean, you, you've got to battle with all sorts of trust and distrust, but uh, I'm going to write a book about what he's on about, so please, please, please um, be ready to buy it in, I hope, um, December 95. Or is that a commercial? I thought you were really rather gentle with them. Yes. Well, I mean, the whole point, it seems to me, at this stage of affairs, is to uh, get in with all the various groups and show that you take sympathetically what they're doing, giving the benefit of the doubt in some cases, but beginning to raise the questions um, which all of us 
whatever our perspective and approach, we will have to face. I, I, I agree with you that, I mean, if you were feeling really tough, um, I think you'd have to say to this group, like you'd have to say to practically every group, really, we, we've got more trouble facing us than we've got any idea of yet. Do you trust the business community any more now than you did ten years ago? No, I don't, as I said, I've said before, it isn't a question of trusting people, it is a question of being realistic about them, but being understanding and, in one sense, loving, to give them the chance to follow up their best impulses over against their bad ones. Take them off to see right. yeah. As he prepares for retirement, Bishop Jenkins knows that there's much unfinished business. And he's not going to go quietly. We know that's not his style, and groups such as the resurgent fundamentalists can add one other certainty to their list. He'll be watching them. I think fundamentalism is just utterly hopeless. Why? Because most people know, one, you can't be as sure as that about a whole lot of these things, and a lot of things fundamentalists are sure about are either nonsense or evil, you know, God being really quite wicked. And secondly, because they know life is more complicated, and they want a bit of realism, not religious fundamentalism dogmatically fending off things and saying you believe this or else. I would have thought that, they, that rather than what you just said, what they actually believe in is that the world, the world has, is becoming increasingly horrible because people have uh, lost their faith. People have lost the link between the, the Christian ideals and the way they lead their lives and therefore more people are turning to crime and more people are turning to immorality and more people are turning to drugs or whatever. Yes. And if people like yourself said, this is right and this is wrong rather more often, fewer people would do those things. We are quite, quite clear about what is right. That's caring for people. That is considering other people. That is considering other people before yourself and so on. All these very simple neighbourly things are absolutely clear, never have been in doubt. Um, the, actually, of course, if you think about the history of the world, talk about battle, murder, sudden death, invasion, pestilence, famine and all the rest of it, uh, it would be very doubtful indeed to say that the world is any worse now than it was, what has collapsed is what people took for granted as what they called Christian morality. But they didn't really face either the realities of sin, including selfishness in themselves in the market and consumerism and greed and so on, nor the vast complications as the world becomes one world and so we're all under pressure. And I would have thought that the reasons for the Christian gospel are stronger than ever, but you don't get them over by dodging facts. It says much about Bishop David Jenkins that he chose for his final parish service none of the grand churches of the diocese, but instead St. Stephen's in South Stanley, a church community that was on the verge of extinction ten years ago. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins and look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The body of Christ. The blessing of Christ be with you. 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 The body of Christ. Saturday, July the 2nd. A congregation from all the Durham dioceses gathered in their cathedral to honour a man who in the official history of the church will be listed as the 92nd Bishop of Durham. But who to them is more simply the Bishop of Durham.
in speaking out in the way that he has, in representing people without fear or favor, in speaking the truth as he saw it. Then he gave people faith. He gave people faith in what he believed. He made them understand what it was to be a Christian. Christianity not as some ancient doctrinal relic, but Christianity as a living, breathing religion able to give life to people who otherwise cannot achieve it. That was what he did for us in our local communities. That is what he symbolized. That is what even when we disagreed with him, we admired the great spirit and character with which he spoke out. We can debate, and many do, his theology. But no one has ever doubted his humanity, his honesty, and his integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much for being our bishop. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much for your fine sermons. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much. And your viewers on the little hill of heaven. Thank you very, very, very much. If you imagine yourself from the Bible, even, let alone life in the world, um, that salvation being related to the living purposes of God which have a future forever um, is a matter of calmness, coolness, absolute assurance, always knowing where you are. I mean, you've forgotten everything from um, trouble in the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane. Thank you very much. Oh, well, I've enjoyed it, really. I must say, I found I found the local press, at any rate, always very friendly. I, no problems. I reserve comments in certain other quarters. I mucked it. Cheerio. Cheerio. Hi. That's it? No. I'm down but not out. <laughs>